Um, so initially, I wanted to talk about mostly tooling today, but uh, I kind of realized the tooling wasn't really the problem. Uh, it's more of the process. Um, so <laughs> I found this tweet recently on Twitter. Um, it was trending uh, at what, like 1,900 retweets? I think uh, basically anyone that's tried debugging something at some point uh, ended up in this kind of situation where you start wondering what the hell is going on um, and eventually you wonder how could it ever happen or ever work. So um, instead of talking about tools today, I'm going to talk mostly about the process. Uh, so instead of just guessing, let's try to do a systematic approach to the, the, the process. So first of all, um, you need to understand the system. By this, what I mean is uh, you need to understand where your application works, uh, runs, I mean. Uh, you need to understand the VM. You need to understand the OS. You need to understand the protocols between the different parts. Uh, if there's any external services, you should try to understand how they also work. If you don't know all of these uh, moving blocks, it's going to be really hard to um, understand uh, where the problem lies. Uh, you can make some, some guesses and try to figure out which part, but I if you don't know all of it, then you're probably missing something. Second thing uh, is you need to know your tools. And by this, uh, there's two things. One, if you know the tools, then you'll probably pick the right tool uh, to find whatever problem you're looking for. And the other thing, um, which is more kind of a tip, but you should always experiment with the tool before you end up in a situation where it's 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. and you're trying to find the bug. Uh, play with the tools in the production environment and experiment. Uh, another point is you need to understand what were and what are the requirements when the code was written. It's possible that it's not really a bug. Uh, in fact, maybe that's what it was supposed to do back in when it was written, and now it seems like a bug because it's not the expected behavior anymore. The second step is to reproduce the bug. So how can you do that? First of all, uh, there's a couple of things to look for. Uh, is there a special function input? Is there uh, a state, a special state that you need to be in? Could be an invalid state or some special environment variable or some OS setting. Um, now, if you're lucky, you'll be able to reproduce locally, which will uh, help you uh, debug more easily and uh, without having the risk of um, damaging the production environment. Uh, if you're dealing with money, if you're, you start tracing stuff, it slows down, request my timeout, and you might be losing money. Uh, so if you're able to do it locally, it's always something uh, that you should try first. If it doesn't work, then try doing it in production. Uh, and like I was saying, uh, if you're able to reproduce, it's much easier uh, to test because you'll be able to iterate w uh, way faster uh, to um, either um, to either figure out if your hypothesis is right or not. Uh, also, having a test case or a way to reproduce it will make it possible to validate that your fix is correct at the end. Third step is collecting data. Uh, before you start going crazy and tracing everything, uh, take two seconds and go on Google and search. Uh, often, uh, you'll find the bug, and someone's already going to have like fix it for you. Uh, then if you're not lucky and it's not there, uh, don't jump to conclusions too fast. 
don't take guesses, use observations. And by, by using observations, I mean either um, use tools to find more data, or just use logic uh, and build, build empirical um, decisions. Um, collecting data can be sometimes uh, dangerous. If you collect too much data, then uh, the problem is going to become even more complex. So you have to really, like I was saying before, pick the right tool for the problem and uh, limit the, the amount of data. Uh, you also kind of have to filter out the noise. Uh, and by this, I mean you might be uh, timing something in the VM. And uh, unfortunately, there's another process on the box that keeps uh, making you context switch. You can't assume that that timing is right. So sometimes you have to filter out some of the data just because you're not controlling the full environment. Fourth step is to use process of elimination. So basically, you have to divide and conquer. Uh, you start with macro observations. Uh, so are all the servers affected? Is it just one data center, all data center? Uh, are you talking to an external service? Is that external service running in multiple data center on every box? This way, you can correlate uh, and figure out if it's like a global problem, pro that problem or just affecting OneNote. Uh, from there, using data, you, you want to narrow down your search um, and always try to pick uh, the one point where your observation will reduce the search path uh, the most. Uh, you have to watch out, though, because sometimes you'll have multiple bugs. And uh, one bug might be hiding the other one, and uh, you might miss it. Next step, uh, which is more of a tip, you want to change one thing at a time. If you change multiple things, uh, you won't be able to correlate anything. And um, one of the strategies we usually uh, use if we want to go quickly about debugging uh, and do multiple changes is that we'll use different branches and deploy one branch per box. This way, we can still uh, do many observations and test many things at the same time, but uh, we still have uh, results that we can correlate. The next point, um, keep an audit trail. So this one is actually kind of hard. Uh, often, you won't take the time to start writing stuff down. But uh, if the problem is hard enough, uh, you might be working on it for a week or, and take a break, start again. You want to keep an audit trail. Your memory is not going to remember everything you've tried, and uh, your memory is not shared with your coworkers. So sometimes if you want to have someone else help you, uh, it's really helpful that they can just read what you've tried, and then they can build on it. It's also useful for postmortems. Um, it's, it's good to be like, transparent about what happens in your infrastructure, usually. So if you have this audit trail, uh, you can write more detailed uh, information about that. And uh, it's also uh, useful to coach teammates. So uh, it might be easy for you to debug that kind of problem, but someone else on the team might not be able to. And with this, this trail, they can learn how to do it in the future. Uh, verify your assumptions. So this is something that happens quite often. Uh, you'll deploy a new change, and you think you pushed it, but it wasn't pushed. Uh, so you have to check if all your assumptions are right. Is the code deployed? Was it, uh, is it the same VM version? Is it the same OS, the same kernel? Uh, is it the same system configs? If you're comparing uh, an apple and an orange, uh, there's no way you can correlate anything. Another assumption you have to verify is uh, your tools. 
your tool might be saying that it took 10 milliseconds to do something, but if the tool is broken, uh, it, it doesn't mean anything. So you want to use multiple tools and make sure they all say or all share the same picture. And um, because you have an audit trail, you can go back in time and look at what you've done. Have you made all the right decisions? It's possible that at one step you took, you made an assumption and you made a jump to another step where it wasn't actually logical. So go back in time and look uh, at your trail and start over. Next point is uh, take a step back. So often you'll be working on the same problem for, for a day or during the night trying to fix it. Sometimes it's useful to just take a step back, uh, sleep on it, and the next day you'll be in your shower and you'll just figure it out. Uh, you also, depending if uh, you have an ego or not, sometimes uh, you want to step on your ego and just ask help. Just, you, there's other people on your team. Um, they probably know or can help. Just ask for help. And then if it's really impossible, no one can figure out the problem, uh, ask an, act, or an expert. Uh, if you have timing issues in the kernel or something, not everyone is familiar with that stuff. Uh, it's perfectly correct to ask for help. After all of this, uh, you finally found a fix. You need to validate your fix. You can't just go to bed and uh, assume that it works. Uh, it might be working in, in dev mode uh, or on your laptop, but it might not work in production. Uh, there might be another bug that was hidden. So you want to test uh, and validate the fix in production, validate it on one node, uh, two nodes, different data centers, and make sure you're not adding any kind of regression with your fix. Another thing you want to make sure uh, is that maybe you're not really fixing the problem, but uh, you're just kind of, it's the side effect. Uh, maybe you added some, some logging to figure out what the problem was and uh, it caused a timing issue and now the problem disappears. So you want to make sure you really found the root cause. Uh, obviously, if you were able to uh, reproduce a problem, you're probably able to write a regression test, and you should. Uh, and after that, if everything is green and everything seems to be good, uh, go back to bed. So these are the, the rules I just talked about in summary. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools. Uh, in the VM, we're pretty lucky. Uh, the Erlang interactive shell is super powerful. Um, you can log in remotely to the node and inspect the, the state of the VM. Uh, there's tons of documentation for the shell. Uh, there's tons of documentation for uh, our functions to get more information about what's going on inside. Uh, here, you can see I'm using like system info uh, just getting the release version, but there's so much more. So much more. Uh, dig in the the documentation. Uh, it's a gold mine. Honestly, there there's so many uh, points where you can get information of what's going on in the system. Uh, another thing you can do in the shell, uh, if you're using Ets table, you can go inside and see what's going on. Uh, that's also, I think, one of the things I use the most to see uh, if the system is doing the right thing. Another thing uh, you can do in the shell, if, if you add um, like functions in your module to monitor stuff, uh, you can write like a name fun, just loop it in the shell, print out stuff, and really see in real time what's happening. You don't need anything fancy. Uh, right now, like this example is just showing the number of messages in uh, the code server. So every second it loops, gives the number of uh, the length of the message queue, and you can see what's going on. 
Obviously, the code server shouldn't be overloaded with messages, but uh, it could be some other process where you're missing back pressure, and um, you, you could see it in real time what's happening. So another type of tools, uh, this one's pretty obvious, but um, it's loggers. So you want to be able to use um, print messages sometimes. Obviously, uh, I don't really recommend using I.O. format in production. Uh, if you have a lot of errors, it's going to blow up in your face. I'd say same thing for error logger. Uh, lagger is much safer if you're in production. And um, I'd say also don't forget the system logs. If you're getting seg faults or it's getting killed out of memory or whatnot, you'll find messages uh, from the kernel. And there's also, you should check uh, your external services. If you're sharing uh, the service on the same box, it's possible that, uh, for example, you have Cassandra running on the node. It's doing a compaction, taking a lot of IO, and at the same time, starving the Erlang VM. So you want to make sure to be able to check all the logs that correlate with the events. The other type of uh, tools uh, that are good for debugging, so metric collectors. Uh, I've talked about it quite a bit uh, last year in my talk. Uh, you want to have as many metrics as you can. They're super useful to debug after and in real time. Uh, my favorite is VMstat plus statsd URL plus statsd. I'm kind of biased because I wrote them. But uh, uh, for me, they work well because they have low overhead. Since uh, we don't collect all the metrics locally, we only sample some of them. Um, there's also tons of other alternatives, uh, Falsum, Statsman, Exometer, uh, which are all application and VM statistics. Uh, for more of a system statistics, there's a couple of tools we use, CollectD. Uh, CollectD will post directly to Graphite all the system uh, metrics you want, plus it supports also a ton of external services. Uh, and obviously, you need to collect all this data. Uh, you can use Carbon and Graphite to, to store it. There's also many, many alternatives. There's commercial alterna alternatives now, too. So do some research. But you should absolutely have it. If you're running any kind of system in production and you don't have metrics or some sort of dashboard showing you metrics, uh, you're doing it wrong. Another type of tool, uh, so debuggers. Um, so there's Erlang Trace, which is super, super powerful, uh, but also kind of dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to receive tons of messages. And you're probably going to run out of memory quite fast. Um, to make it a little bit easier, there's DBG, which uh, works well, but is also kind of dangerous. There's no limit on the number of messages you can receive. So these two tools, although super powerful, are kind of dangerous in production. Uh, a better alternative, at least for production systems, is Redbug. Uh, Redbug will limit to number of message and it gives you a nice little syntax to match messages. Uh, other debuggers, which are more OS plus application, uh, there's System Tap, Dtrace, LTTNG. Um, those are super powerful. They're a bit more complex to understand, but uh, it's worth spending the time to try to understand how they work. Program dumps. Uh, the VM, when crashes or when it gets a, a signal, uh, can dump a crash dump. Uh, the crash dump contains a lot of information about what's happening in the VM. It's super useful to, uh, to read it after uh, it dumps. Uh, there's many ways to do it. In Observer, there's a crash dump viewer. Uh, that's probably the most user friendly. There's also, uh, in the recon um, application, I guess, from Fred, uh, there's a script directory where there's a bash script 
which will give you some information from the crash dump. And uh, if you're a little bit more familiar with uh, Unix tools, there's, uh, it's mostly strings, so you can cat prep uh, and usually find all the information you're looking for in there. And then if you're doing the NIFs, uh, core dumps, or if you're getting like some sec faults in the VM, uh, it can be also very useful to understand what's happening. Profilers. So profilers are obviously good for performance bugs. Um, there's included in OTP, there's fprof, eprof, uh, which are based on Erlang trace. Uh, they're powerful, but the output might be a little hard to understand. Uh, one of my favorites these days is eFlame. Uh, I talked about it last year in my talk. Uh, now what we do is actually, since most of our services are HTTP servers, uh, we have an endpoint where I can go on it and I just get the SVG in my browser and I can just uh, profile random requests uh, happening. Uh, and then again, uh, for profiling, you can use system tap, dtrace, LTTNG, uh, which will probably give you more or realer results since they won't include uh, context switching. And uh, yeah, uh, there's also perf uh, if you want to see really what's happening. Uh, inside the VM performance-wise. Uh, we used it to figure out uh, why some of, our, um, some of our Boolean evaluation stuff was slow. Uh, we found out that 40% of the time was spent just copying uh, objects from ETS to the process. So <laughs> uh, it can be useful. And there's many other ones, but uh, I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, system utilities, so in the same sense that you need to understand the full stack, uh, you need to know your OS and the system utilities to observe what's happening in the system. Uh, here's some of my favorites which I use probably daily, uh, top htop to see the CPU usages and other metrics. Uh, and then if you're doing anything networking related, uh, I use ngrep probably. 10 times a day just to see what's happening uh, HTTP-wise, uh, netstat to see what's up with the sockets, TCP dump if you need to dig a little bit deeper uh, in TCP, uh, and then a tool that's really useful to just see uh, what's happening is S-Trace. Uh, seeing the syscalls, you can really see if it's blocking or something, you'll figure out uh, way quicker than just trying to guess, I guess, uh, what's, what's really happening. Um, and then if you're using files or, uh, or sockets, uh, IOTOP will give you uh, IO information, um, and LSOF will give you uh, the files open, or the files. Uh, those was just like a small, a really small sample of utilities you can use. Uh, there's tons of performance and Linux uh, observability tools. Uh, I can't recommend enough Brendan Gregg's book. Uh, if you want to really do anything performance-wise in Linux or uh, BSD, you should really read his book. Uh, there's so much information. And uh, yeah. Next, uh, static analyzers. Uh, those are good for typing bugs. In the, the Erlang ecosystem, there's Dialyzer. Uh, if we were using a type language, then we wouldn't have this problem. But um, Dialyzer is really, really useful. Uh, there's a lot of documentation online on how to use it. Uh, so if you're not using it, you should start using it. Tools for the bug. Uh, so this is a summary of what kind of tools you should use um, for types of bugs. So for logic bugs, uh, if you didn't understand the specs or you just did a mistake in your logic, debuggers, loggers, and the shell can be useful. 
if you did a mistake in typing, uh, debuggers, shell, static analyzers uh, will help you for resource bugs. Uh, so if you're leaking memory, leaking files, uh, metric collectors, program dumps, shell, system utilities will show you for performance. Uh, again, metric collector, shell, system utilities will be super useful. So uh, if a request crashes and no one is around to monitor it, does it trigger an alert? Uh, by this, I mean you should really be monitoring everything. Uh, obviously, you don't want to trigger an alert for uh, everything because you'll never sleep. But uh, if you don't monitor it, you'll never know it's happening. So uh, I'll go over some examples of uh, debugging I do, uh, or I've done, or someone in the team has done. Uh, first example, this little chat excerpt. Uh, so I woke up in the morning, go in the chat, and um, read a little, little, this little snippet where uh, my boss says the numbers and the reporting UI are completely fucked. Um, so. Uh, where do we start from there? So before I go deeply into the problem, um, uh, you have to understand the full scope of the, the, the stack. So the reporting, this reporting UI has a web application which stocks a reporting service, which stocks an analytical DB, which gets filled up by an ETL, which uh, comes from logs, which comes from a backend server, which comes from HTTP requests, that comes in. So if you don't understand all of this, uh, it's really hard to pinpoint where the problem is happening. And um, it's going to take more time. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of time just turning in circles and not really finding. So for this example, uh, what I did, I checked, first thing I did was checking the numbers in the database. Um, and the numbers in the database were not good. So I concluded that it wasn't an application bug and it wasn't a reporting service bug. Then I looked at the logs. Were the logs good? No, there was missing events. So it wasn't an ETL bug. So basically now we had, it could have been uh, just a backend server bug or uh, there's just no request coming in so the numbers uh, shouldn't be there in the first place. So uh, the next step was to go check the backend server and see if the data was being aggregated. So I validated there was actually a request coming in, and then I went in the shell, uh, got the, the TID of the table, and then did a tap to list on it. And then I saw the table was full of data. So obviously there was something wrong. Uh, with the data coming out of ETS and going to the, the disk. So at this point, it could have been either uh, serializing this data to JSON, or it could have been the way we log the data on disk. Um, I assumed that the way we uh, save the data on disk was OK, since that's the same way we use everywhere. Uh, and we haven't changed the code in like four years. So uh, let's look at the way we uh, serialize the data. So for this, I used Redbug. Uh, I trace the one function, which is called. And uh, the function runs every minute. And you can see, um, basically, it ran at 9.07 and then 9.08. But it should have been called many times, because it, it's a recursive function over the list. And in this case, there's two items in the list, so it should have called itself again. Uh, the fix was actually really simple, uh, and it was a dumb logic mistake. Uh, we added filtering for undefined uh, in the metrics. So when the flight ID was undefined, we just return an empty array or empty list, and then we had a case to uh, not log the empty list, but we forgot to put the map counters. Uh, so it wasn't calling itself in that one case. And uh, 
For some reason, usually the undefined event was one of the first one in the list, so it's always just cut uh, and only uh, iterate over the, the head and then stop. Uh, in this case, uh, I think tracing was by far the easiest way to see what was happening. Uh, I think we had a fix for this under like an hour in production. Uh, second example, uh, at some point we started getting uh, these errors in the log. So uh, cowboy protocol parse errors. Uh, and uh, they were kind of just happening randomly on some servers, uh, sometimes more, different times of the day. Uh, so we were kind of puzzled by them. Uh, so first of all, uh, since this is like live HTTP traffic, uh, it wasn't that easy to uh, just reproduce, uh, especially because it's like keep alive. So uh, first we, we tried just Googling the error. We found uh, a ticket open in Cowboy about something similar. Uh, there is no solution to the problem, and it was, I think it's still open. Um, so we added some extra logging in, uh, in Ranch to print out what the state of the request was when it crashed. Uh, and from that, we kind of guessed it would be, uh, it's something about the buffer it has, it keeps. Um, but we couldn't really figure out what was happening. So uh, we, tr we, well, our first guess was that the content length uh, for some of the requests was wrong, and that's why sometimes it would read the body, uh, but there'd still be some data on the socket, and when the next request would come in, because it's keep alive, uh, the buffer would be uh, wrong. Uh, so we used mgrep to validate. Unfortunately, uh, all the requests were okay. So uh, we had to move on to another uh, hypothesis. So uh, instead of just trying endlessly, uh, we decided to capture TCP stream and uh, replay it. Um, I built a little tool called HTTP replay. It's on my GitHub. It's kind of alpha, but if uh, feel free to send a pull rec if you find a bug. Uh, so we replayed the traffic uh, locally, and I was able to reproduce, but not deterministically. Uh, so the problem would happen sometime, sometime not, and it would not be uh, the same pattern we'd see in production. So at that point, uh, I'd spent way too much time writing this, uh, this replay tool, uh, and I had no idea what else I could do. So I stepped on my ego and... Uh, told my teammate to, to try at it. So he did try. Uh, he tried tracing, uh, no dice. Then uh, he, well, we both stopped thinking about it. And uh, during the weekend while driving, he had a Ruka moment. Um, we were passing around the cowboy request between processes. And uh, inside of it, there's a socket, but the socket is mutable. So if you do change, or if you do read from the socket, uh, that one request object that was in the previous process will not change its state, but the socket itself will change. Uh, this is kind of the pattern we use. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Cowboy, uh, there's the ranch acceptor, which accept connections and spawns a cowboy protocol uh, with the socket. This cowboy protocol will call the, the handler. And in our case, because we have a pretty strict timing requirement, uh, we spawn another process that will execute and try to build a response. And if the response is not uh, completed in time, we send a default response back. So in this case, we would read the body in the internal request handler, and whenever we time out, uh, the previous process, the proto cowboy protocol, would reply with uh, the default response, but using the request that was not updated. 
So that request object or record uh, would have the state that the body wasn't read, but in fact it was read. And the next request that would come in on the keep alive uh, would be bort. So this, uh, this kind of happened not that often anymore, but uh, so you'd get paged by, uh, by Dynec, which is our DNS provider, saying this, there's service trouble. Uh, and then five minutes later, you get an email from Nagios saying server is down. Uh, and then you SSH to the server, and you found out that the VM is dumping. Uh, so where do you start? So while we're waiting for the VM to dump, uh, first thing I usually do is go check Graphite. In this case, it was pretty obvious what was happening. Uh, there's a message queue that just went crazy, uh, and it ran out of memory. So after waiting for the crash dump to be done, uh, I used the little tool I talked about that's in Recon to analyze the, the crash dump. Uh, one of the things it shows is the different messages queue length. Um, so in this case, there's one process with 1,400,000 messages, uh, seven process with two messages, 22 process with one, and like 10,000 with zero. So it's pretty obvious that probably most of the memory was in there. Um, and then if you want to figure out which process that is, uh, you can just grep for that number, uh, and you'll find uh, the information about that process. In this case, uh, the process was the uh, anchor server, which is a client we use to talk to memcache. Uh, so I looked at the code after, uh, and the code is pretty simple. Uh, this is obviously a simplified version, but uh, it's just a proclib that loops uh, and handle messages. There's really two messages it handles most of the time unless the connection goes down. Uh, one that sends and one that receives. The receiving one is uh, non-blocking. So the most, li the, the most likely culprit is gen tcp send. Uh, so what happens if gen tcp send blocks? Well, in this case, you pile up messages. Um, so, Next step was to validate that GenTCP can actually block. A uh, quick Google search will tell you that it can. Uh, you can also uh, validate yourself by cre creating a little uh, toy server that will accept and keep its, uh, its buffer full so you can't send to it. Uh, how do you fix that? There's a couple of ways. Uh, you can mitigate by using the send timeout option. Uh, but again, if there's too many and the timeout is not low enough, uh, you can still grow your queue. Uh, the real solution is to add back pressure. Yay, uh, unbounded queues are fun. Um, so the, the pattern we usually use for unbounded or for back pressure, uh, I think it was discussed earlier in another talk, is um, using ETS counters. Uh, we increment a counter and set a default max value. When this value is reached, uh, it means you can't accept anymore. So uh, basically, you'd pass the table ID, the max value, try to increment. If it returns that uh, the previous value and the new value are the same, that means it can't increment more. If uh, it's smaller than the max backlog, then Yes, you can do it. And if there's an error, well, it means the table is not there and you didn't actually uh, create your back pressure uh, ETS table. Uh, after adding that, a quick way to test was uh, to actually uh, block the socket on the other side to make it uh, fail on purpose. And then uh, I was able to just check by using the, the terminal or the, the shell uh, that it was doing what it's supposed to do. So the backlog grew to whatever the limit was, and the number of messages in the queue never went over uh, that backlog limit. So uh, some tips. 
this is a sample from my rebar config and uh, most of the projects I use. Uh, you want to have your tools ready in production. Uh, if it fails at 3 a.m., you want to just log in in your shell and be ready to trace right away. You don't want to start deploying stuff. Um, and uh, again, don't hesitate uh, to play with them in production before there's a real problem. It's much easier to debug when you know what you're doing. Uh, second tip is build your own tools. If you end up doing the same thing in the, in the shell, if you always print out some statistic about queues or some statistic about uh, some process, build a little wrapper, call that instead. Uh, one, it will save you time. Two, uh, coworkers will be able to use it. And um, if you're writing uh, gen servers or anything that has like a state, uh, add some functions to actually query the state so we can see what's happening. Uh, add a function to give you the table ID so you don't have to guess and find which one it is. So that's it. Thank you. Questions, questions in the audience? No questions in the audience. Everybody's tired. It's the end of the day. Uh, I have a question. So other than uh, Erlang, what other production language experience do you have? Uh, I've done a lot of Ruby, uh, some Objective-C, some C, some Java. I was, so in terms of debugging a complex Erlang application, how does it compare? to some of those other experiences in other languages and other ecosystems? I'd say it, it depends on the type of bug, but for anything running like a system in production, um, the, the tooling is pretty good. Obviously, some of the more advanced, like uh, the GVM has a lot of, lot of like, tuning possible and uh, ways to introspect the VM. So, and I, I'm not that familiar with all the tools. Uh, but compared to most languages, I think it's, it's up there. Like, there's no, uh, it's not missing anything. You didn't find the error messages just generally appalling in Erlang? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, think, I think this is one of the lessons you learn really quickly. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it did crash quite a bit. Uh, I think the first three months we wrote the service, uh, it was crashing. Maybe uh, one node a day would crash with error logger stuff, but uh, eventually lagger came out, and uh, we also put some fixes in place. But yeah, that, that's maybe one place that could be improved. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir, in the front. Um, about the uh, um, audit trail uh, you talked about, and then. I think it's easy to forget if once we is fix the issues. And then I'm interested in how you guys manage the, the, the rocks, how you, what kind of issues have happened, and how did you guys fix it? And then how do you guys manage that kind of information in for future reference? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have a, we're a pretty small team, so managing this hasn't been really of an issue. Uh, my favorite way is just having Google Doc, and uh, that way it's shareable with everyone in the team and accessible for everyone. Uh, but we're we're probably like three working on the Erlang backend, so we can we still talk <laughs> when there's a problem. We talk to each other. Uh, obviously, as the team grow, we'll need maybe a better better titles for whatever we're using. But uh, currently, yeah, it's just Google Docs. Any other questions? I have one follow-up for that one. Uh, log aggregation, you guys are sending metrics to Graphite. Are you doing it? I mean, how many nodes do you have in, in production? Yeah, uh, I didn't talk about that. But yeah, we do, uh, we do have log stash in place. Uh, there's also a lot of other commercial alternatives out there. That there are. Splunk is one of them. Look pretty good, but uh, cost a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But no, for now, yeah, we're just using Logstash. 
Uh, there's other types of tools, too, that I didn't really talk about. Uh, there's like trend analysis stuff nowadays that you can kind of figure out when a metric goes bad or whatnot. Uh, we've tried playing with it. We weren't able to tune the, the algorithms right to actually get anything sensible out of it, but uh, it's definitely possible. Cool. All right, Louis Philip. Thanks.